Welcome to Feeling Seen, the podcast that talks about the movies that make us feel seen. Today we're talking to comedian Jackie Cation, who, in addition to being a comedy legend, is also a member of the Max Fun family, co-hosting the Jackie and Lori show with Lori Kilmartin. She's feeling seen by Benji from the 1982 movie My Favorite Year. He's a young comedy writer making inroads and mistakes as he finds his way in the industry. Jackie will tell you all about it in just a moment. But first, it is the final week of Max Fun Drive. And that doesn't just mean we have very awesome scads of bonus content that you can access if you become a member today. It means that if you become a member of Maximum Fun, you are directly supporting shows like mine, shows like Jackie's, shows like Eurovangelists. We are a user-supported, listener-supported, subscriber-supported network. We are independent. We are calling our own shots over here. We have our own editorial discretion. We have our own editorial independence. And for that in media these days, feels like you can't put a price on it. But you know what? Maybe we can put a price on it. We can put about five bucks a month on that price, which is the beginning tier of becoming a member of the Maximum Fun family. Take a minute right now and go to MaximumFun.org slash join. And thanks a lot to everyone who has already done so. We truly appreciate it. All right, let's get back into my conversation with Jackie Cation. You know, really in the spirit of Maximum Fun Drive, my guest today is a fellow Maximum Fun colleague. Uh, You may know her from comedy albums such as Staycation. Ah. And I believe it. I want to make sure I'm saying it right. This will make an um, this will make an amazing Horcrux. Excellent. I believe this excellent. will make an excellent Horcrux. I couldn't go without citing that title. Um, but she also has a very tiny comedy special out called Looking Back that was filmed from the rear reverse camera of a Mazda. She also has a podcast called The Dork Forest, as well as The Jackie and Lori Show. She has five comedy albums behind her, and she is my guest for the day. Jackie Cation, what else do the folks need to know about you before we get started? Oh, besides that you'll be coming up on After Midnight on CBS soon. Right, right, right. April 3rd, um, Lori and I are going to be doing um, After Midnight with Maria Bamford. Um, Mm -hmm. We're all on the panel. It is uh, a comedy show that looks like a game show, but there are no stakes. No in your heart. That there's nothing to win. And so we're, we're doing that. And then I also, uh, I just did like another 15 minute set for something called Don't Tell Comedy, mm-hmm. uh, which is the world is full of 15 minute sets, Jordan. <laughs> and sure, sure. I am willing to get a three camera shoot on them. Uh, <laughs> so I did do like Staycation was a, a four or five cameras uh, that I I think it's two years old now, but because um, uh-huh. it came out right after lock- lockdown because oh, my okay, last name's yeah. Cation and we were all no, home. I That's why I had yes. to say the title, Staycation. That's right. fantastic. And This Will Make an Excellent Horcrux was my previous special and album. <laughs> this Will Make an Excellent yes. Horcrux was called that because my soul was in it. It was probably <laughs> the first album where I did, um, where I had like a lot more personal stuff in it mm-hmm. where, cause you know, I had two albums before that mm-hmm. and those albums are funny. They're great. Uh-huh. Whatever <laughs> circus people. Uh, it's never going to be bread. Those are the names of those <laughs> albums. But uh, the thing about Horcrux is that it was, a, I'd run out of sort of just sort of uh, common like i think i was in my late 30s and i'm like Mm -hmm. i guess i'll be talking about something real now and Uh that's so horcrux was that and then the one after Mm -hmm. that was i'm not the hero of this story Mm -hmm. uh because for 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 two albums my album titles were super long and those (laughs) are those two albums (laughs) and horcrux has a has a special attached to it a video and then Mm -hmm. uh staycation has a video a a special attached to it but hero did not i should have gotten it filmed because uh who knew who knew that everyone was going to want to see clips forever? <laughs> yeah. I didn't know. I didn't know. <laughs> I didn't know. Uh, yeah, we pivoted to video and journalism, and it didn't quite work out as well for us as other video formats. Right. Oh, and then, so looking back, nobody bought Staycation. Like, it's on mm-hmm. YouTube for free. Right, right. <laughs> With ads. 
Feel free. So is Horcrux, by the way. They're both uh, <laughs> they're both just watchable. A couple hours of stand up mm-hmm. if you like to see your see your stand up, as mm-hmm. opposed to listen to albums because they're also on Spotify and iTunes and wherever the hell you want to listen to them. But um, but looking back was me just angry. I was just angry. Mm. I couldn't sell Staycation, so yeah. I was like, I'm going to put this Mazda in reverse. I am going to yeah. pay someone $100 to keep their foot on the brake so it's not a <laughs> snuff film. And then I'm going to do 10 oh, minutes yeah, of Oh, yeah, because you'd have jokes. to have it in reverse yeah. to activate the camera. Mm-hmm. That's right. <laughs> Was a Mazda picked for its superior cinematographic quality? I'd love to tell you that the camera on a Mazda 6 is amazing. But the reason it was is because the director, Kyle Clark, who's our producer over at Jackie and Lori, um, mm-hmm. has a Mazda 6, and it I'm had like- a camera. And my 2013 Corolla doesn't have a camera. Mm-hmm, so mm-hmm. we had those two choices. Mm-hmm. And uh, there was a, there was some talk of, like, getting other cars with the rest of the staff to get, mm-hmm. like, other camera angles. And I was yeah, like, yeah. I don't care this much. I just want to tell <laughs> 10 minutes of car jokes into the ass camera of a car. Is that funny? <laughs> and it is kind of funny. So if you go to I my website, you funny. can watch it. Yeah, you could watch it. 10 minutes. Yeah, it's t- I, I watched it. I thought it was funny. Um, I feel like I could just keep bringing up non sequiturs. So I feel like I should just force myself to get in to the t- like our main topic here. And you've brought you brought a trio of characters. I feel like I won't spoil them all up front. I don't know. Um, but I will go with uh, the sort of headlining one. I've decided it's the headlining one. A movie okay. I had not seen. So well, this was a go. wonderful discovery. My favorite year. One of my favorite movies. And I'm so what glad that you had not movie. seen it. And then you saw it and your heart was made whole because it is a delight. It is a delight. And it stars Mark Lynn Baker as Benji Stone. He seems like a... He fell into a career of comedy writing for a late night show. <laughs> right. And I, I love his preface at the start of the movie. He does he uh, does a prologue where he's like, they don't they don't make years like 1954 anymore. And he talks he goes on to talk about this pivotal moment in his life in 1954. In 1954, television was live and comedy was king. Comic stars like Milton Berle, Sid Caesar, and Jackie Gleason kept America in front of their TV sets. I was the freshman writer on the comedy cavalcade starring Stan King Kaiser, Saturday nights at 8. There. There I am. That's me. Benji Stone. The guy carrying the guy with the sword. The guy with the sword is Alan Swan, the greatest movie idol of all times and my personal hero. As this, like, freshman show, uh, freshman TV writer, he's the one who kind of has to eat shit and get everybody's, like, meals for them. Right. (laughs) And they have a big, difficult, unreliable movie star coming in to be on the late night show. And that is Alan Swan, and he's played by Peter O'Toole. Just one of the most fascinating presences in the history of filmed camera media. And so he has to make sure Alan Swan is occupied, looked after, and not falling down drunk. And able to get to the taping of his late night show that he's going to do uh, with Benji Stone and, and like, you know, the whole cast of characters. And it was you gave Benji Stone as your point of identification in this movie. And I like I was so looking forward to this as soon as it started. I was like, oh, well, this seems like it's going to be great. By the end, I was like, this is a fantastic film. This is a fantastic film. It's one of the world's one of the world's most perfect films. It genuinely is. There isn't <laughs> a bad scene in that movie. Uh, there's a scene where he's trying to uh, explain how to tell a joke. Anyone can tell a joke. Not me. Yes, you can. I'll teach you. I'll tell you a joke, and you tell it back to me. Okay. (laughs) Okay, I'll try. First rule, never tell a joke sitting down. You have to be on your feet and use your hands. This guy walks into a psychiatrist's office. He has a duck on his head. The psychiatrist says, can I help you? The duck says, yeah, get this guy off my ass. (laughs) Okay, now you try. Okay, here goes. A man... Hold it. This guy is better than a man. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, And use your hands. Oh. Sorry. Right. Go ahead. (laughs) I loved Jessica Harper in this movie, by the way. I was like... Where was more of this Jessica Harper in comedy? Right, right. Jessica Harper was amazing in this thing. Yes. And, and then it would just, it had such a cast of characters. 
the 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 Filipino bantamweight, the uh, <laughs> yeah. his mother, the the neighbors, every mm-hmm. every because it was based on sort of not Ed Sullivan, but like I think it was mm. called uh, I forget the name of the of the sketch show that it was sort of based on, mm-hmm. but like Carl Reiner and. Um, and and there there were all these famous uh, comedy guys, Mel Brooks, and all these guys. Uh, Marissa wrote, is inserting producer Marissa. Our show of shows. It might have been our show of shows. I think it was our okay. show of shows. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. It's heartwarming. It's mm-hmm. super funny. It's and super funny. It's just absurd, and it's not, and it holds up because uh-huh. it's from I think the late eighties, right? Is that? 1982, early 80s. Yeah, early 80s. That's right. I mm-hmm. saw it in the theater because I might not be super young, you guys. And <laughs> um, yeah, so, but it was it was such, and Mark Lynn Baker, of course, went on to do a sitcom from this, mm-hmm. um, Perfect Strangers uh, with Balky. And mm-hmm. um, oh, wow, was I a Perfect Strangers fan. Right? Because, yeah. oh, because his, his, he's, as an actor, he's just so charming. Yeah. Right. So what I what I felt seen in this thing is the fact that he's he just comes from this quirky family Mm -hmm. and he like he changes his name. I never changed my name, but I mean, I was like Mm -hmm. I distanced myself a lot Mm -hmm. (laughs) from this from my family and mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. to do stand up and to try to have this career and uh, and I tried to, st- to change myself a little bit so that I could like I didn't really when I first started doing stand up I I had never felt so empowered and so mm. like I like I finally found what I was supposed to do in life mm-hmm. and it gave me the ability to just sort of reinvent myself. Mm-hmm. And that's what he is doing. You know, he's just like, and he's trying to be all things to all people kind mm-hmm. of when, when Jessica Harper says, where was this guy? Mm-hmm. This guy's great. Mm-hmm. And I was like, yeah, no, no, it's just, it's really nice. You know, you're just sitting there having your dinner, wearing men's clothing. Well, sort of, <laughs> I mean, I really like this guy. I like this guy much better than the other guy. What other guy? Oh, you know, the guy in the tiara. The mosquito who bothers you in elevators. The the person who runs down the hallway with scotch tape all over his body. The human fly. Like, when I first started doing stand-up, and eventually, like, my stepmother was like, I don't want to talk to Johnny Carson right now. Could I talk to (laughs) someone real? And, uh... Right? It was... Yeah. So that's what... That's how I related to it, kind of, I think. Well, I think now, is that something you find? Is that a sort of proliferate tendency among folks who are who are comedians, like who are of comedy in that way? Where like I I know like in the limited experiences that I've had being around, especially multiple comics at a time, there's an impenetrability to the way comics will relate to one another compared to the sort of normies who are right. orbiting around them. And that reminds me of something that you said. Um, I listened to your Caitlin Palufo episode of The Dork Forest. Okay. And you were at, and she was talking about HGTV and Joanna Gaines. And she said that <laughs> Joanna Gaines was funny. And you were like, is she people funny or is she comedy funny? And that was such an interesting distinction to me that I've thought about a lot but never framed that way. And so I wanted to hear you talk about people funny versus comedy funny. Because I feel like we see that with Benji in this movie too. Right. Right. Because people, everybody, unless th- there's real trouble, almost everybody is funny, right? <laughs> yeah. And almost everybody, th- you know, everybody has a sense of humor. Everybody has something mm-hmm. to offer. And everybody can be hilarious uh, mm-hmm. in, in the moment. But comedian funny is a purposeful thing, right? Yeah. And it's it's orchestrated and it's repeatable. And mm-hmm. it's all of these things, right? Where you... If you are a comic, you have to be able to say something funny and say it over and over and over again and make people <laughs> yeah. laugh over and over and over again. Different people, yeah. right? It's it, it goes to different audiences, but um, mm-hmm. but people funny is just you know walking around funny. Just uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> and anyone can do that, and and almost everyone does, right? Where uh-huh. you're just like, uh, that made me laugh, and you're like, yeah. okay, that wasn't you probably couldn't. Do that again. Yeah. You probably, yeah. 
My favorite sort of uh, my my favorite funny friends in my life are the ones who it's even it's not even necessarily like the witty repartee that they have. It's just the particular way that their voice sounds and they say something words, the emphasis that the, with the way that they'll talk and sort of the rhythm of their speaking. It, and that is not replicable. That is so of the moment. Right. Very much of the moment. And if yeah, to be able to repeat it is, I think, imperative. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I should say, I should say. Yes. And I well, is that something, have you ever found like, like with your, you know, I'm not trying to talk to Johnny Carson right now. Is there, does it take practice once you start getting really into comedy and that becomes your profession? And it seems like one of those, those professions that is a calling and it's a personality as much as it is a job. Like, it's like, well, I'm doing this because I can't do anything. Like, this is who I am. Right. Does it take a, a an experience or a practice or a sort of like being checked at some point to reconcile the comedy you versus people you? Or is that something intrinsically you understood how to delineate? You no, knew I that think you were doing Carson. I have to tell you that I don't know if it's true for everyone, but for me, mm-hmm. I fell into stand-up so hardcore and loved it so much that it became 85, 90% of my personality. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it, and it bleeds into my cadence and it bleeds into Mm. the way I talk to people. There is a, um, for a while, uh, a muscle that I've had to work in the last 20 odd years, because about 25 years ago, Mm -hmm. and I was at that point about 15, 17 years into stand-up. Mm. Uh, I, yeah, I would have been, yeah, I would have been about 17 or 18 years into stand up. I decided that I would like an entire life, Jordan, instead of just stand up <laughs> comedy. Yeah. Uh, I decided I would like a boyfriend. I would like mm-hmm. possibly a dog, like mm-hmm. any, anything that isn't mm-hmm. stand up comedy, because I had just been wandering the earth doing stand up and getting laid and drinking and doing drugs. And mm-hmm. I was like, I don't want to, I don't. I don't need to have kids. I don't need Mm -hmm. to own a house, but I would like to have other people in my life that aren't just some rando dude at a casino. How about that? And, um, and it literally was a conscious decision. And one of the other conscious decisions I made was to be sincere Mm -hmm. in when I talked. I was wondering, I was going to ask about sincerity. So I'm so glad you brought that up. Well, I mean, and it's, and it's not that my comedy isn't honest and it doesn't of come course. from a sincere place, but mm-hmm. it, um, but, and some comics write their, the, all, their entire stand up is this fictional world, mm-hmm. right? Um, but my, my stand up, you know, is almost all entirely based entirely on truth. And then hopefully there's a twist and I write mm-hmm. a punchline. Uh, mm-hmm. Otherwise, I ju- I'm just repeating what other people say, you guys. Which is also funny, <laughs> uh, but the uh, uh, but I will say that there's you know when there's a sincerity to to like when you talk to me, I am friends with a lot of people, mm-hmm. and I've always because of stand up been willing to admit anything. Mm-hmm. I'll, I I will mine every gross thing that I've ever done in my life mm-hmm. for a joke. <laughs> I don't. Yeah. There are no boundaries, and some people think of that as sincerity some people Mm -hmm. think of that as vulnerability yeah for me it's not it's almost Mm -hmm. the exact opposite in the way that it's like another shield Mm -hmm. where you don't see you don't know Mm -hmm. i'll tell you that i'll blow a guy on the steps when i'm in my 20s uh Mm -hmm. i don't find that sad i find that hysterical you know or whatever (laughs) right or just like something weird right like Mm -hmm. but there there is something more real about sincerity yeah that where i just have to slow down Mm -hmm. don't tell people (laughs) the funny thing don't tell people the gross funny thing just how about you listen to them Mm -hmm. a (laughs) yeah how about you fucking shut up (laughs) <laughs> and sometimes on my hand, I write the word listen because I'm a freaking chatty that's magoo. knowing oneself right yeah, there. <laughs> that's because I am the chattiest magoo you've ever met in your life. And I will just go on and on and on. And uh-huh. I mean, and the dork forest is literally my favorite dork forest or where I ask somebody about something they love because that's what it is. It's about you tell me about something you love a lot. Mm-hmm. And my favorite ones are where I don't even have to ask questions. It's just plug and play. Right. It's uh-huh. an exercise in listening for me. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And you can tell when I really, like, I don't know the person, but I want them to like me 
because I mm-hmm. talk a lot. I'm like, <laughs> how about how about this? What if I what if I what if I tell you this funny story? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, Cation. Why don't you just slow your roll and let them talk? <laughs> but so in real life, though, to l- to listen is an important thing. Mm-hmm. And the sincerity of a real person is also that I'm not trying to entertain them. I'm yeah. just going, well, life life is fine. I'm plugging along and I'm trying not to walk into the sea yeah. and, uh, or whatever, <laughs> right? Um, but I try not to, and I try desperately not to get a laugh mm-hmm. in real life mm-hmm. where I'm just yeah. like, don't just play to the laugh, play to, yeah. the, play to the real well, that is that lines up so well with this movie. That is sort of like the heart of this movie, I feel like, is its mission to show you that exact process that Alan Swan hasn't really attempted to initiate in his own life. And instead, like, it's Peter O'Toole. He's not a young man. Like, he's a he's an aging star in this film. He's Errol he, Flynn, essentially, yeah. Yes, he's Errol Flynn, and he is known, like, what does he say? Like, you can always count on Alan Swan. He'll he'll never fail to disappoint you. That's a sad sight. You're a sadder sight. All you end up doing is making anyone who cares for you unhappy. You know, they say about me, Stoneberg, you can depend on Alan Swan. He will always let you down. Did you tell Tess that? Well, that's right. You couldn't get out of the car. Like, he knows that he lets people down. And so instead of doing anything about that, he slips into self-pity and charm. Mm -hmm. And he can charm his way. He he goes off on a rant at one point in this movie about how he's so tired of people letting him get away with everything. And so he drinks and he screws around and he's late and he is feels like he is so subordinated to the idea of Alan Swan that he has given up on being the man Alan Swan. And his life is in so many ways sort of devoid of sincerity and authenticity. And then you have this foil in Benji Stone, who's the most like eager beaver, want to get it done, like so charmed by this career that he has in TV writing, but has also made a persona for himself. Like you said, as Benji Stone, instead of, I believe it's like Benji like Steinman. It is a Steinberg, more apparent, I think. Steinberg yeah. a more apparently Jewish name that mm-hmm. he wants to put in, put behind him. So, you know, he can get further in his career. So it's not like a he's seeing the ugly future of what he could have. But Benji is also learning throughout this process, like in that scene with Jessica Harper, where when he is just regular Benji and not job Benji it actually works for him in the way that being like a womanizing young comedy writer doesn't have any effect for Jessica Harper right and and Alan Swan remember changed his name his name Clarence wasn't Alan Duffy. Sp- Clarence Duffy and Clarence mm-hmm. Duffy um, you know and he says that he's not that swashbuckling hero he's not yeah. that guy and you know Benji's like I need that guy I need my heroes yeah. as big as they can be. Alan Swan, afraid? The defender of the crown? Captain from Tortuga, the last night of the round table? Those are movies, damn you. Look at me. I'm flesh and blood, life size, no larger. I'm not that silly goddamned hero I never was. To me, you were. Whoever you were in those movies, those silly goddamn heroes meant a lot to me. What does it matter if it was an illusion? It worked. So don't tell me this is you life size. I can't use you life size. I need Alan Swans as big as I can get them. And let me tell you something. You couldn't have convinced me the way you did unless somewhere in you, you had that courage. Nobody's that good an actor. You are that silly goddamn hero. Both sides of my personality are needed. Mm-hmm. You know, I need to I need to perform and to make people laugh and to and to do what I do on stage. Um, because people really like that. If I went on stage mm-hmm. super sincere and just <laughs> was like, you guys. <laughs> nope. Please don't. Yeah. And then the check doesn't clear. So um <laughs> but but like and and it is and it is a gift that that the character Alan Swan gives to Benji, right? Mm-hmm. And and the guy that Benji is during the day is a funny guy, and he's mm-hmm. also the guy that that is willing to riff with the boss, mm-hmm. and but he is also sincere. He's also a real yeah. person. So 
And we find now, the real person in Alan Swan, too, with his daughter. Yeah. Hey, God, it's such a... Not that we don't know Peter O'Toole's a great actor, but it's such a wonderful performance by Peter O'Toole. Like, to be this... To yeah. be this heel a bit, mm-hmm. but not really, because he's totally sympathetic. Like the character of his driver, who is he always, whenever Alan's in town, he sort of like foregoes any other jobs because Alan pays him two fifty a night. Yep. Great money. But he also like he like says something to Benji at one point, sort of like, It's Alan, you forgive him. Yeah. And like there's this kind of no matter what he does, he's such a rascal. Mm-hmm. But he's so cause, but his his heart kind of does come through on his sleeve. And that gets the people who have a greatest sense of who he authentically is to to give him such latitude and to forgive him. But even toward the end, like when he has just when Alan sort of slipped too far into self-pity, even the driver like because he you know, Benji throws him in the car and he like tosses the keys to Alfie and he's like take him to the Waldorf, like, get this guy out of my sight. Like, that's it. And even, like, his driver looks at him and then just throws the keys at Alan. Like, even the driver, mm-hmm. who's sort of his main apologist, like, handler, he will pick up, he literally right. picks your him up and puts him in a cold and, shower. Right, your closest friends and family, your closest workmates, whoever mm-hmm. it is who who settle, who tolerates your bullshit, mm-hmm. who, who goes, well, you're, you're funny enough. Because what Neil Gaiman said... To keep the job, you have to either mm-hmm. be on time, really good at your job, <laughs> or um, really easy to work with. And mm-hmm. if you're two of those three things, yeah, you can keep the job. If you're mm-hmm. only one, they're willing to let you go. Where's your sweet spot of your check column, two of columns A, B, and C? Where's your sweet spot? Uh, I'm always, I think... I don't know that I'm a genius, but I'm always on time and <laughs> I try to be easy to work with. <laughs> I think that's my that's my lane, too. Like, yeah. I, I'm really good at certain things. Mm-hmm. But in terms of like a job, a job can kind of be anything. You're called to be different things at different times. I I I am going to be the person who will show up and be like, team, let's go. Let's Tell me do what this to do. together. Tell me what to do. Yeah. And then when I forget mid mid task, tell me how to do it again. <laughs> Yep. And I can, because I can hear it. I can hear you. Could you might have to tell me three times how to do the job, but I will do it exactly how you want me to do it, and then I will get the fuck out of the way. How about that? All right, it's time for a quick break, but Jackie will be right back. And as for me, let's talk a bit more about the Max Fun Drive. You guessed it; it is more Max Fun time, but it is almost over. It officially ends on March 29th. Your time is running out the day after this episode drops. But if you're listening this weekend, it's not too late to head over to MaximumFun.org slash join and join us or upgrade your membership. You'll want to do it now because this is the time where joining gets you cool gifts and helps you unlock rewards, both at the network level and for this show. So yes, become a MaxFun member anytime. Tell people in line at Whole Foods and family friends to become Maximum Fun members anytime, but tell them if you and they do it right now, you get extra little bonus incentives. Thanks to Feeling Seen listeners, we've already passed past our first milestone goal for this show, which means we will be drawing names for folks who will win a poster from my original one sheet collection. And as I am recording this, we are so close to unlocking the next milestone, so close, which is even more exciting. We will continue our bonus content all year long with special episodes deep diving into the pantheon of erotic thrillers. You really want to help us get past that finish line. And you can do that now by going to MaximumFun.org slash join. You can only do that now. This is, remember, like we said, this precious window of time, that's the time where you get free gifts and stuff. One more thing. Tomorrow, March 29th, is the big Max Fun Drive closing show at the Elysian Theater here in Los Angeles. You know, a little bit of a local news update. I know that sounds very LA specific, but we are also live streaming that. I am co hosting it along with Danielle Radford. Lots of your favorite Max Fun hosts will be there, including several past guests of the show, including Janet Varney, Drea Clark, and Oscar Montoya. Shouts out your evangelists, just to name a few. And it starts at 5 p.m. Pacific time and will be streaming live on YouTube. So, Lucky you if you're in L.A. and you can maybe make it to the Elysian. But if not, join in the fun online on YouTube. We will put the link in the show notes. So this is it. This is the final big ask. Help support the continued existence of this show. Hit pause and head to MaximumFun.org slash join. Now, let's get back to my conversation with Jackie Cation. 
before I get into the other two characters, who I will kind of, like, group into a, a conversation, I wanted to, like— here, if you even saw this movie in the theater, like I wanted to hear from you if you if there was anything to say about like this kind of era of comedy. Watching this movie made me think of Airplane. Right. And I was talking to producer Marissa about this before we came on, and I'm not one to be like, oh, we got to talk about like I'm a horror fan. Like, how are we gonna talk about Alien and Psycho all the time? I'm like, we've talked about them enough. Like, I'm good letting other people talk about those movies. I want to talk about new stuff. But like, then I watch comedies from this period, especially ones like that had a satire bent to them. Mm-hmm. Man. They just don't do it like that anymore. And, like, the joke density in ways that, like, I feel like so much of comedy now is recognizing that, like, or at least, like, in the recent time, perhaps not where we're going. I don't know where we are. You're the professional. But, like, re- the the kind of nature of, like, I did a thing. Like, so that happened. Like, right. kind of a it, it referential be, to the comedy. Yeah, it could be, it could be, and it sometimes could be real cool kid, kind of like, well, we just yeah. put some put some shit together over the weekend you're like no you had to find george clooney's sweet spot that's (laughs) not you don't get to just say that but a a perfect example of a movie that i think is in this vein Mm -hmm. uh that is new is long shot which is seth rogan oh seth rogan charlie theron liz hannah the liz hannah comedy yeah yeah and charlie's theron and the thing is is when this came out I mm-hmm. was infuriated. I was mm-hmm. like, did Seth Rogen just buy himself a trophy wife of a romantic comedy? Because <laughs> yeah, Charlize right, Theron right. wouldn't talk to him. And uh, But maybe she, I mean, I don't know that, but because uh, I just had just seen Mad Max and I loved it. So, I mean, the romantic comedy part of it is hilariously unrealistic because he's just failing upwards in a ridiculous sense. And, um, but as a, as a, as a very, like a really good heart, like mm-hmm. then I saw this movie and I was like, "Oh, this movie is great! The it's long fantastic. shot, long, it's fantastic. It, 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 it has and, like it's it, it's one of those movies that has this chorus of supporters where they're like, guys, the only people who don't like Long Shot are people who haven't seen Long Shot. Everybody who likes this, <laughs> who sees this movie, likes it. I didn't like it before I saw it, and now I've seen it six times. And the thing <laughs> is, is talk to me about the density of jokes, though. That ha- it yes. has that, which is great, and it has a really good arc to it. Anyway, so but that so I think it can be done, and it is done. But mm-hmm. there is a lot of sort of cool kid, yeah, we just threw together some, uh, some a comedy here. And you're like, just stop. Just <laughs> tell me that you're working for a living because we're all working for a living. And you want it to go well. If you're a comics, you're, you're working harder than most to make a living. Well, so. and T- Tina Fey once said about 30 Rock, she said, I'm psyched that our fans think that we were trying to make art, but we were actually trying to make friends. Uh, we're mm. trying to make the sitcom friends and we failed luckily you <laughs> liked it anyway <laughs> yeah yeah well how was how was like how would you like do you, what was the sort of shaping factor of those comedies that like airplane era my favorite year era that just like do you did those kind of like form you coming into your comedy or were you a child of a different era in terms of your sensibilities uh, I never watched stand up and the only comedies I saw when I was a kid were all really old like mm. all of those uh like the Abbott and Costello stuff mm. and then the road movies with Bing Crosby and and, uh, and uh, Bob Hope <laughs> and yeah. then um the things that I thought were smart like the mm-hmm. cuz sometimes I wish I was sort of more like my stuff isn't that smart but people are always mm. just like mm, it's t- too smart you can't go to Baton Rouge and I'm like fuck <laughs> you you're underestimating Baton Rouge you really and you're over on under now. Oh, everyone gets cable it'll be fine and yeah. um and but it isn't as silly as some people mm. like I wish and I I become sillier actually in the last 20 years than I was the first 20 years I was a little mm. I was a little a lot crispier you know now it's a little more goof but it is also a lot more like the with with me doing a lot more personal stuff Mm -hmm. the undertone is can be a little serious and you're like (laughs) so again i've done something weird but i can't write any comedy but the comedy that i write so it's Mm -hmm. fine but the comedy that influenced me as a kid was all sitcom stuff right Mm, okay so it would have to be the two that did me the most would be um, Mash and Barney Miller. Mm, okay, okay. Barney Miller, I was the only nine-year-old in the world who had a crush on Steve Landisberg. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> I don't know. I got to meet him once when I first moved to L.A. And uh, oh, he wow. was... 
I did, I don't believe I and and I actually am, I if I think I didn't say anything, which I which I <laughs> hope I didn't say anything, right? Because yeah. nobody wants to hear when I was nine and you were uh-huh. in your thirties. You're so old. Mm-hmm. Anyway, uh, I I believe I did not say. I just said that I was a big fan. Because I don't know if you've watched Barney Miller recently, but it freaking holds up. Okay, on the topic of, of silliness then, I feel like that is a good segue into the, I want to say the pair of other characters you brought, which is, and this was a first time watch for me. Oh. The robot dog from oh, Axel. the movie <laughs> Axel, capital A-X-L, and the titular Roger Rabbit of Who Framed Roger Rabbit. Right. Two two characters who I really linked together as underestimated figures that were fighting against their prescribed place of belonging in order to truly become themselves. <laughs> Axel is so bad and to gi- and to us- <laughs> and to give Axel that depth of character, I would mm-hmm. actually like to see that movie. Uh, sadly, <laughs> That is not the movie that's available when you watch Axel. Uh, You have to watch Axel wanting to see that to some extent. Mm -hmm. And it's true. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, Which is which is true of everything you go. When I moved to Los (laughs) Angeles, I was told that I had to choose to like it. Otherwise, uh, I could easily (laughs) not like it. And uh, (laughs) but that's probably true of Omaha, quite honestly. And um, it's everywhere. So wherever you go, (laughs) choose to like it, choose to be choose to be psyched about your move and then Mm -hmm. meet people. Uh, Mm -hmm. Okay, so Axel and Roger Rabbit. Yeah, yeah. Axel quickly, guys, the story of. A uh, young boy who competes in, or young man, I guess, who competes in motocross, and <laughs> he is an outsider, as described by like the movie's plot summary. And he happens upon a military-engineered robot dog that is meant to be a killing machine, but it imprints on him. They become friends, and it's like a you know Johnny Five short circuit situation. <laughs> like we got to protect the robot at all costs. Vroom, vroom. He's friends. We yeah, are friends. exactly. It, it's like rad. Plus short circuit yeah. is is Axel and it co-stars Becky G. Yeah. So there's an appeal for the youth. <laughs> um, but yeah, that is Axel. So that's that's our Axel character. Axel is the dog, and then there's Roger Rabbit. And Roger Rabbit, of course, is uh, he's he's framed. He's framed for murder, mm-hmm. man. Mm-hmm. And uh, and he's but he's just he's in in some ways the Roger Rabbit character is summed up in the Jessica Rabbit Rabbit character. Oh, sure. Because Jessica Rabbit at one point says, I'm not bad, I'm just drawn that way. One of the great lines, as far as I'm concerned, in the history of film. Yes. Uh, And it's Kathleen fucking Turner, her voice. I'm not bad, I'm just drawn that way. And you're like, oh, God. We all relate to that, right? Because (laughs) inside of this sausage casing, of mm-hmm. a stack of I'm just a stack of meat over here with a brain on top <laughs> and then but the sausage casing is you know several holes and a haircut and <laughs> yeah. uh and because of the sausage casing people see me yeah and they assume well they assume of course naturally that I can't be trusted to make my own political decisions <laughs> uh about my body and they make all these you know and then they also I look like a viral video of someone who's decided to ruin their career over a parking spot and um and all kinds of bullshit right so Uh it's just everybody has their own sausage casing and we see the sausage casing and we judge it so Mm -hmm. in the case of of axel uh you know axel just wants to be a dog he supposed to be a dog. He supposed to play with somebody who loves him. Yeah, and so they get to run and jump and ride, and it's super fun. <laughs> it and is super um, fun. He literally blows himself up. Spoiler alert! <laughs> yeah. But here's the thing: we can't handle it as a people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So there's 20 more minutes of movie uh, <laughs> because, uh, and then we find out that he's backed himself up on the uh, dark web. Yeah, he's, so. he, don't worry, guys. Axel's consciousness is cloud-based, <laughs> which means Axel, too, is just waiting to be made. Why not? And, <laughs> Why and not? Yeah, and then and Roger Rabbit is literally drawn to be a goof, mm-hmm. but he has deep love for Jessica mm-hmm. Rabbit. He is and also... He is, yeah. by no accounts should this little rabbit be with Jessica. 
No. There, that is not a man you would look at that, Roger, and say, Jessica's his gal. She is the Charlize Theron of the animated world. And <laughs> yeah. uh, But Roger Rabbit makes her laugh as Seth Rogen? Seth? Mm-hmm. Seth? Yes. Okay. Seth Rogen. Uh, I mean, you, I can't express to you, Jordan, how great my career would be if I could remember people's <laughs> names and faces. I cannot. And so for three years, I thought it was pronounced Adelaide. It's Adele. Uh, <laughs> But I, but I I have no memory. I can't I don't I can't tell people apart. I don't know who anybody is, and it's very sad. But I will say that because Roger Rabbit and Jessica Rabbit, but he is, he's a good friend. Mm-hmm. He's oh, a yeah good, yeah he's loyal, loyal loving loving funny mm-hmm. not as dumb as he looks. All the things, right? Yeah. All the things. That's where I feel seen. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, <laughs> well, what does this list tell us about the presence or lack of women on screen that you have connected to? We, when we had Lisa Ann Walter on, she picked a character of her own because she was like, listen, I'm a brassy lady who is not like a tiny size four, and I've been doing comedy since the fucking 80s. Like, I've been out here in the trenches like there aren't women like me on screen. like lately there are closer to but like I've got me to look to. Right. Right. It's yeah, there's no there there are, you know, what what uh, is, is it going to be Russell and Russell and his girl Friday? It isn't. <laughs> It's not like we have not... had somebody choose Rosalind Russell from his girl Friday. OK. Yeah. I mean, it, it's like there. It was Mary Heron. But yeah. <laughs> right. I mean, it might be Jodie Foster in, you know, or Tatum O'Neill. I think those uh-huh. were the closest I came when I was a kid. Oh, interesting. You know, like Bad News Bears and, um, mm-hmm. you know, but what I when I was a kid, there were no like it wasn't going to be Princess Leia. Yeah. You know, it wasn't going to be. Was it going to be some woman from Porky's? Fuck off. <laughs> and uh, so I was like, you know, I don't want, I wanted to be the boy, right? Mm-hmm. I wanted all the power of, I mean, that's, in my opinion, unsolicited and and uh, and from the hip, uh-huh. uh, is that every 10-year-old I know is a they-them now because right, we yeah. sexualize 10-year-olds. Mm-hmm. And every 10-year-old I know would like to not be sexualized and would right, like to yeah. be a child cool. for another five mm-hmm. or six years. And so mm-hmm. they're like, I'm a they, them. And you're like, mm-hmm. that's right. You're a stack of meat with a brain on top who's a person. <laughs> yeah. You are not a, a boy or a girl because you're not a man or a woman mm-hmm. and nobody should be hitting on you. So yes, my little 10-year-old. <laughs> yes. <laughs> just be a they, them for now. And and. At about 10, you get to see that boys get stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Boys get respect. Boys get expectations. Boys get a lot of stuff. Mm -hmm. And conversely, girls get stuff. Girls get Mm -hmm. to be emotional. Girls get to Mm -hmm. have their feelings. Girls Mm -hmm. get to... Uh, go find something pretty to wear because they're encouraged. Mm -hmm. Girls (laughs) are also encouraged to have crushes. Mm -hmm. You know? I mean, girls get different stuff than boys get. Mm-hmm. So what 10-year-old doesn't want all of that? <laughs> They'd like expectations and get to be whole people. Yeah. So if I can leave 10-year-olds alone, okay? <laughs> so, um, but the, so when I was 10, everyone I wanted to be was like, I want to be Tarzan's boy. Right? Yeah. I want to hang out with an adult male figure who is a superhero. <laughs> Yeah. Who is just going to get me away from the crocodiles and, <laughs> you know, and also teach me how to swing tree to tree. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and, and then also have a positive mother figure. And then, mm. right? Or I want to be friends with Han Solo. Han yeah. Solo and Chewbacca will get me out of trouble, you know, but I'll get uh-huh. to go on the adventure with them. You know, right? So there were no girls. So there yeah, was no one yeah. that I could, that I could be. So, mm-hmm. Do you, do you find, like, does that, is it like a sort of frustrating consideration in any way? Or is it just like, yeah, it is what it is? Well, when I look back on it, I was like, for a heartbeat, I was like, right? And then I go, <laughs> right, right. And yeah. now it's over. <laughs> and and it's slightly better, right? Mm-hmm. Progress of civiliz- civilization moves tiny, 
tiny, tiny, uh-huh. tiny, tiny. But yeah. it is so much better than when I was a kid, which is why banana heads would like to take it all away. Right? <laughs> yeah. Which is like, we would like to either control you or kill you. Is that is that too much? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Wouldn't you rather be controlled? No, nope, you want to die. Okay, interesting. Yes, I would rather die. Which sounds like the bad guys in the movie Axel. <laughs> right? Which is exactly, because Axel just wants, literally, Axel just wants to be a dog. And, and all the, all the, they're like, we can either control his... you, Axel, or we can kill you. Right. And it's not Axel's fault that he's no. sentient. It's your fault that Axel's sentient. So, yeah. do you know why? Because he, he's sentient. So mm-hmm. sad, too bad. Now you're going to have to deal with that. Women are people. I'm sorry. <laughs> I've spent my entire career trying to be one of the guys. Yeah. And um, it's okay. Mm-hmm. But I just, uh, in the probably the last 10 years, I've decided I'm okay not being one of the guys. I'm okay... Mm-hmm. If there's uh, and if, if if something, it's one of the things I love about the younger comic women comics, mm-hmm. is because because for thirty years in the green room it was all men and me, yeah, and or it was all men and some other woman, mm-hmm. and uh, and there would be something gross said, mm-hmm. and there'd be no one to make eye contact with and go. Mm-hmm. Are we just going to sit here and allow this to happen? Uh, yeah. You could occasionally find a decent dude. To make mm-hmm. eye contact with, but most of the decent dudes were looking around trying to avoid having yeah. to either stand up to that shit wit either. Mm-hmm. And, but, but now there's usually another woman. Mm-hmm. Uh, Beth Stelling was in a great room with me one time when <laughs> uh, I think it was Pete Holmes just said something gross and mm-hmm. I got to make eye contact with Beth Stelling and then I got to mm-hmm. say a thing and Pete Holmes was like, oh, you're right. Uh, so it was Good all fine. job. Right. But the thing is, is so in the last 10 years, I've just like, I'm just going to say that's gross. Yeah. Yeah. And you're at work. I'm going to, yeah. I'm going to alert you to the fact that you're actually not sitting on a toilet. How about that? Mm-hmm. Uh, don't be a piece of shit. <laughs> and, <laughs> like you're, you're actually in a work. <laughs> There's no HR, but I'm just going to yeah. tell you, I, I don't necessarily need to know. Uh huh. No, I think that's an, and I, I guess to, I guess to, in an attempt to close, that will, I think it's an interesting parallel with Benji in my favorite year where like, when he's like yelling for Alan Swan, he's like, I need Alan Swan. Like, I need my hero to be bigger than life. And it could be, goes from this sort of fantasy escapade that he's been on with this beloved movie star of his throughout this movie. And it's, it's been causing him anxiety. It's been causing him stress. It's not just been all, you know, champagne and roses and stuff. But like when he's yelling that to Alan at the end, he's demanding more from him as a person and a friend, but also was like, I need to do my fucking job right now. And you are getting in my way of that. And right. the way that it comes crashing down into sort of like a real situation, it is fascinating in, a, in an entertainment career. You're tasked with both needing to be able to keep the magic alive of what you get to do enough for yourself to slog through the bullshit of doing it because there is a lot while also being pragmatic enough to un- perceive it and know it as a job at the same time so that like you can be a professional doing a good job and not do things that would be in violation of an HR department if it existed. So right. that like I guess my final question would be like is it that recent thing that you have found like the towing like are you able to tow the line between both and are you able to maintain the sort of enchantment with a career in this like you know crazy yeah. chosen path that you've been on and main and and like is it it's, difficult to reconcile that it's with muscle, pragmatism it's muscle memory mostly where i just have mm. to give myself a pep talk where i get to do stand-up comedy my career yeah. from like sort of a bird's eye view or a, mm-hmm. a drone's eye view hello <laughs> um but like f- from outside my career looks amazing mm-hmm. and if i know that mm-hmm. and accept the fact that i get to do the thing that i love to do yeah. And I don't have to go to a day job and I don't have to, you know, there's a lot of things I don't have to do. Mm-hmm. And the fact that I still get paid half of what a dude gets paid. If you accident, if a booker accidentally sends me, oh yeah, we're booking this guy and you. And then I get an email and it says he's getting four grand and I'm getting 2,500. Right. I literally am like, why slap me in the face over this? It's just like, <laughs> and then I have to tell the guy comic because I, mm-hmm. I want him to take the money. I don't want yeah. I don't yeah. ever want a guy not to take the work. Yeah. But I want him to be aware that cuz they're usually not. They're they're just in their of own fishbowl. They've mm-hmm. got their castle. Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. uh, I've got my castle in my fishbowl. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so, and my castle in my fishbowl is actually nicer than somebody else's fucking castle in their fishbowl. Yeah. Right? The battle is real, but it's a battle inside of myself and outside, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because I also, I'm told to be grateful and I am. Yeah. But I also... Like somebody, I keep being introduced as a fucking legend, and I'm like, well, what does that pay? <laughs> and uh, I don't think you understand. <laughs> yeah, what does that do to my quote? I mean, I could go down that, and I do a little bit on the Jackie and Laurie show. The Jackie and Laurie sure. show, by the way, it's uh, occasionally full of bitterness, but we uh -huh. always, it's full of, uh, it's all, we celebrate and despair stand-up uh -huh. comedy i mean that's what yeah. the whole show is right mm -hmm. the jackie Lori show as opposed to the dork forest where someone just tells me how much they love arm wrestling or whatever <laughs> yeah, i listened right? to that episode too <laughs> comedy is such a mystery to me i feel the way edmund Keane did the great english actor mm. on his deathbed Keane was asked how he felt he answered dying is easy Comedy is hard. Okay, so I guess then, back to Axel for a moment, and I will say, as we, to close out, what would Axel incarnate as in Axel 2, if you were to get that sequel? He's been a dog. What is Axel coming back as for Becky G and her man? Well, I mean, it wouldn't be fair for him to have to be a horse, because <laughs> then he would have to carry them around but um that would look so cool though. <laughs> that, like metal horse metal horse on a beach like black beauty <laughs> where the two of them are just white linens blowing in the wind <laughs> yes where at, at a beach where they inexplicably receive mail like they do at the end of <laughs> <laughs> well, he is uh, Bluetooth enabled. Um, <laughs> the, um, yeah, I don't. I, he would have to be some sort of like if they were going to make him into something, they would make him mm. into a tank or something, right? Like, because he's <laughs> like he's a dog. It doesn't make any sense that he's a dog. By the way, there's no there's no reason for him not to be a Terminator y kind of dude, right? <laughs> or even just one of those 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 carts that deliver pizza that you see on the street. Street, right that, that blink their little yeah. light eyes blink i love them yes and, uh, but they can be <laughs> thwarted right. with so easily like a room i'm okay. gonna go then with axel too is he's a horse <laughs> <laughs> he's a big fucking armored horse that looks like he should be jousting in in the last duel and covered in steel armor that's it that's shout out to thomas jane in that movie a threatening get somebody with a bow and arrow for a yeah. moment. Like, you guys, Axel, you know, obviously you can watch a classic, like my favorite year. You can also watch Axel. Axel's which is, available. Axel's <laughs> available on, on Freebie. So you can watch it without paying anything. I think I bought it. Like, I, saw, I think I saw it on, on an airplane and then I was like, oh, I need to see this for reals. <laughs> I'm going to come back to this one. It's like the well, original Mortal Kombat movie. You got to watch it. You, you gotta, do. You have to watch you that own and the, yeah. the original Street Fighter and probably the original Super Mario Brothers movie starring another Bob Hoskins <laughs> treat with John Leguizamo, Dustin Hoffman. Wow. Like, yeah. Like, that's a trio. I need that. Like, I need some specialty disc house to put out that trilogy of video game adaptations as a box set. Rights be damned. Put it all on one box set. Jackie Cation, thank you so much for your time and for going down these conversational tributaries with me. I, I really appreciate you being here. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much to Jackie Cation. There's so much more Jackie out there for you on the internet. Years upon years of Jackie on the internet that you can access. You can listen to her podcasts, The Jackie and Lori Show, or The Dork Forest, or check out her specials. They are all linked on her website, JackieCation.com. And remember to look out for her on After Midnight next week on April 3rd. And now, one quick thing before I go. You guys remember last year when a movie uh, called Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey came out? Well, guess what? Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey 2 is now out in the world. This is independent cinema, you guys. The first Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey 
was made for like $50,000. And I think they shot it in like seven days. And the second one, thanks to the startling success of the first at the box office, it made more than $5 million. Well, guess what? Now there's a Blood and Honey 2 and it's out and it got almost a half a million dollars of a budget due to the success of the first one. And I'm here to tell you, that first one was very impressive for what they did on limited resources. Like, the way it looked on screen, they they used that money on the screen. The second one? Guys, this is a movie. <laughs> this is a motion picture. It's fun. It's it's a pretty, it's a good slasher. It's a good slasher. They, they got to step up their visual effects and their prosthetics because they had more money and time to work with. Um, so the creatures of the 100 acre wood, uh, look a little more jazzy. Uh, there is pathos. There is acting. Uh, I just, I don't want to spoil anything about what goes on in a Winnie the Pooh blood and honey movie, but it has been reported in the trades that there is a whole, oh my God, I'm actually going to say it, Pooniverse that is on the way. And when I say on the, on the way, I literally mean it, not like it's conceptual or it's a maybe or it's a one day. They're like currently in production on Bambi the Reckoning. Bambi the Reckoning. The filmmakers are talking about Blood and Honey Part 3. There's going to be like an Avengers style sized, um, a, a, like a, all villains assemble movie that they're working on. There's they're shooting a a Pinocchio movie. That is, it's a Pinocchio scary movie. Like, actual Pinocchio is a scary movie. But, like, like the, you know, imagine the darkness of a story that, like, includes, like, a little boy who wants to be a real boy. And, like, you know, him coming to life as, like, a sort of demonic, like, witchcraft creature. And they're doing a Peter Pan, like, a dark-sided Peter Pan movie. Where, like, I, I saw the intro to Blood and Honey 2, and they were like, yeah, you know, a guy comes to uh, the window of children and, and beckons them to come outside to Neverland. Like, you can see how there's a lot of dark potential with that. So, like, these are movies that are getting made. Like, the Avengers Assemble movie of these creatures is slated for 2025. Like I said, Bandy Reckoning is being shot right now. All of these movies, like, Winnie the Pooh 3 is definitely happening. These movies are all happening. And I saw a little kerfuffle on Twitter where this got announced, and people were getting really mean about it for some reason. But guess what? This is just a bunch of guys in the UK who had an idea to use, like, art that didn't have, you didn't need permission to use, like, characters you didn't need permission to use, and to make horror movies out of them. And you know what? If you can make a movie in $50,000 for seven days and have it be a smash hit success and make almost $6 million at the box office, it is so hard to get a movie made. Good for you. Keep it up. Keep keep the good times rolling. It, shoot. I, like, it is, it's, it's go see independent cinema for Winnie the Pooh, Blood and Honey 2. Uh, you can check that out. And inexplicably, on the note of perversions of A.A. A. Milne stories, that's our show. Uh, if you like it and you haven't yet, please do not forget to go right now to MaximumFun.org slash join and become a member or throw us a few more dollars a month if you're able. Uh, you can follow us on Instagram and Twitter at FeelingScenePod, whether you're a subscriber or not, or send us an email at FeelingScene at MaximumFun.org. If you want to follow me, I'm Crew on Twitter. Our theme music is by Andrew Epen. This show is produced by Marissa Flaxbart. Our senior producers are Kevin Ferguson and Laura Swisher. And this is a production of Maximum Fun. Maximum Fun, a worker-owned network of artist-owned shows, supported directly by you.